All right, so we will get started. We're going to cover methods today. Just a fair warning, this is a heavy lecture. Um, each of these methods in itself is kind of a discipline of its own. Uh, we're not going to dive like really deep into a lot of them. We'll get a little bit deeper in, into like MRI and things like that because it's used most frequently. Um, but I am not expecting you guys to understand all of this, how it works, all that kind of stuff. I kind of want to plant the seed. I want you guys to know what it is, kind of how it's used. And as we keep coming back to those things throughout the term and talk about studies that are being done, hopefully you'll kind of understand how the methods work a little bit better. As kind of a walkthrough of what we're going to be doing today, uh, we're going to go through the different types of methods that are used to pick up on brain function. And we're going to start with kind of the, the older methods, the, the lesion studies, case studies. I was actually really excited to get to the assignment for this class. I designed this entire curriculum and everything to revamp. This is the first year that's been called cognitive neuroscience. It was called neuropsychology before. Neuropsychology is the study of lesions. And that was really, really important <coughs> at the beginning, like 60 years ago. That's not how it's done anymore. So uh, we'll kind of briefly touch on these case studies at the beginning. Um, and then we'll get into some of these technological advances that have really ramped up the way that we look at the brain. So we'll start with uh, artificial lesions, with things like TMS. We'll get into electrical activity, like measuring direct electrical activity with EEG and MEG, looking at single cell recordings and animal models. And then we'll get into what is the most widely used methods in cognitive neuroscience, which is picking up on metabolic activity. So using MRI to look at blood flow, the, the like re-feeding um, the neurons that have just used a bunch of resources. That's what I refer to as metabolic. So before we get started, I just kind of want to give you guys a primer on anatomical direction. You guys are going to see a lot of brain region names throughout the term. Um, and you're also going to see a lot of slices that are required with MRI imaging. So the sagittal plane is a plane that goes right through the nose to the back of the head. So this is an image that would be from a sagittal view. You can actually move that plane from left to right as you look at the brain in that way. The coronal plane is perpendicular to that plane. It actually goes through the ears this way. And so you can move from front to back when you're looking at things in the coronal plane. And then the axial plane is perpendicular to both of those. That's a transverse plane, it's horizontal. So it kind of cuts through the middle of the face this way and you go up and down with that one. And these other terms here are terms that are more important for identifying actual brain structures because this is a way that people that originally named all these brain structures were talking about it. So like, they're naming a brain structure that's located within the temporal lobe, but it's in the back of the temporal lobe. It's a posterior temporal region. If it's in the front of the temporal lobe, it'd be an anterior temporal cortex. Um, rostral and caudal are not used as much, but um, so rostral and anterior are going to be the front, so closer to your nose. Posterior and caudal are going to be further back, so towards the back of your head. And then going in the other direction, kind of up and down, we have dorsal. If you think of like the dorsal fin on a fish or a dolphin or something, it's going to be a top, so a superior. And then ventral is going to be things near the bottom <coughs> or inferior. This is going to get really important when we start looking at uh, the different pathways for like object recognition and stuff. There are dorsal pathways that will take a route up through the top and there are eventual pathways that will kind of take a path through the bottom. So just make sure you kind of know the difference between these. It's not as important to know like what the different slices are called unless you're going that route and getting into MRI, but you should know kind of the difference between posterior and anterior, and dorsal and ventral. Cool. So we're going to start with looking at kind of how brain function was inferred at the beginning using lesion studies, case studies with specific patients. So this was this idea that we could use a specific person that had had damage to their brain to try to figure out what that part of the brain was doing because now their behavior has changed. We can infer that that behavior has changed because of that damage, right? And 
This assumption is based on this idea that when you lose a certain part of your brain, you're also losing the function from that part of the brain, right? Now, this was kind of true in a sense. Uh, there's a lot more to it, though. Uh, lesion studies are very limited because of the fact that we know now that especially higher cognitive functions are diffuse properties. So there's a lot of different brain regions that are interacting and creating these behaviors. It's not just one region. But that was kind of the idea. So I mean, this was Phineas Gage, the rod through his head, his personality changed. They assumed that this part of the frontal lobe was responsible for those personality traits. Uh, you have patients like HM that had damage to the temporal lobe and had really bad memory deficits. So these are the different types of damage. Looks really nasty. So vascular damage is referring to blood flow that has been kind of rampant in the brain. So if you have an artery that bursts, aneurysm, stroke, things like that, uh, the blood flow is actually going to drown those neurons and you're going to have atrophy. It's going to start tearing away at it like this. Uh, you have tumors which can impinge on different brain regions and cause pressure and disrupt the function in those regions. I don't know if you guys know about the... The, the guy that posted himself up in the clock tower at the University of Austin with a sniper rifle. Uh, he didn't have any indication that he was violent or anything like that. And then one day just started having these, these weird dreams, these weird thoughts, and wrote an entire letter about how he felt like he was not in control of himself anymore. And post-mortem, they actually found a tumor that was impinging on his amygdala. So, kind of interesting when you think about agency, right? Like, do we really have as much control as we think we do? Um, you have other things like degenerative and infectious disorders, things like mad cow's disease that will actually eat up and degrade the neurons. Traumatic brain injuries, what TDI stands for, so concussions. Uh, there's actually... Uh, right above your eyes, there are some bony prominences, some like sharp ones that face backwards. And so if you hit your head this way, your brain actually gets shoved up against those sharp edges. And you can have parts of your frontal lobe where the axons are getting cut and things like that. So that's a very common spot for damage when you have TDI. Um, epilepsy is the other one. Uh, so if you have rampant activity in your brain, if the neurons are firing nonstop, it kind of burns them out, and you can have loss of function from that. Um, you actually see a lot of the, there's a lot of techniques that are done with uh, epileptic patients to try to localize that, uh, the focal point of where the seizure is coming from. And it gives us the ability to record activity in a different way that we'll look at later. So this is, this is an important slide when we're talking about uh, inferring function from disease and from these like loss of brain regions, um, we're looking at single versus double dissociations. So a single dissociation would refer to the fact that there was damage to a very specific region and there was loss of a very specific behavior. Um, the, the mistake is that single dissociations aren't really telling us much about what that brain region does. Because just because the behavior is gone because that brain region is damaged, doesn't mean that that region does that behavior. That region might be involved in a broader network. It might be a relay station for information. It's really hard to infer from just one type of, of damage whether or not that brain region actually does what you think it does. Uh, the opposite side of that, um, a clearer picture, not the perfect picture, is a double dissociation. Uh, this would be you have one uh, subject that has damage to a very specific region that has a specific behavioral change. So let's use, so for a single dissociation, let's say you have a patient that had damage to a specific part of his temporal lobe and you can't see faces anymore, right? It would be a mistake to say that brain region recognizes faces. That brain region is definitely involved in the recognition of faces. But this one, let's say that you have one person that has damage to that region, can't see faces, and you have another patient that has damage to a different region and they're not able to recognize objects. They can still see faces, but they can't see objects. That's a better just double dissociation. You're showing that disruption in one area is causing a very specific, specific behavioral deficit, and damage to another region is causing a completely different one. And those two behaviors aren't overlapping with one another. So it's a clearer 
type of picture that like these different brain regions are involved in different types of functions, but it's still not getting it causality. It's still not showing us exactly what those brain regions are doing. Um, this single dissociation is a form of reverse inference that you'll see in uh, MRI. Just because the brain region is active doesn't mean that's exactly what it's doing. So this is a little complicated, but uh, we'll come back to it a bit and we'll talk about it. So, and this is kind of just a proof of concept, see if you guys understand it. So, a uh, doctor notices that his patient's lesion is inhibiting his ability to speak, but it's not inhibiting his ability to understand language. What type of dissociation is this? The clue here is that there's only one subject. There's only one type of damage, one type of deficit. We haven't been able to compare it to someone else that has damage in a different region. All right, so this would be a single dissociation. And this was the method with lesion studies. Like the, we, we learned a lot from lesion studies. We learned that the hippocampus was really important for memory because people that were missing it couldn't form memories, things like that. Um, but it really didn't shine enough light on how the entire brain is kind of cooperating in the entire um, creation and behavior. So what we'll get into now is some really cool new technology. It's not really widely used. It's, it's definitely picking up. Um, but it's this ability to actually create artificial lesions, to turn off brain regions temporarily. It's kind of creepy. Honestly, I'm having it done later this week for the first time. We'll see if my brain turns back on. Um, but these things can also, so they can remove function, but they can also induce activity. So they can cause regions to fire um, artificially. And so this gives researchers the ability to turn things on and off and to test things within subjects. So TMS is the most popular version of it, transcranial magnetic stimulation. And so it's actually a, a coil of wire that's in kind of a protective sheath and it's connected to these electrical capacitors. So when you run electricity through these packs of wires, it creates a magnetic field that can be directed at specific parts of the cortex. And that magnetic field can either disrupt or can induce activity within that region. And that excitation or inhibition depends on um, how strong you're making the field, the timing of the field, frequencies, there's a lot of different things that you can adjust to kind of change the properties of that. The limitations here are that it has about a one centimeter radius <coughs> of cortex that it can actually target. So really, really small region that you're targeting. It's also only targeting things that are superficial. So it's only targeting things that are on the outside, so cortical areas. It's probably a good thing that it's not turning off deep brain structures, because those are like what are pumping your heart and things like that. So I definitely wouldn't do one if that was the case. There are other forms of this. These were actually around before TMS was, was big. Oh, actually, I'm going to get into a little bit more about TMS. So as I was hinting at, this is really, really nice for doing something within the same subject, right? So you can study what's going on in that subject's brain when they're healthy and normal. And then you can turn off those regions and see what happens in that same individual. And so in this example, so this individual was looking at a screen and was just asked to identify what letter was on that screen. And they positioned the TMS over his occipital lobe, which is what is controlling vision, right? And when they turned on the, CM, the TMS, the subject was unable to recognize or even see the letter and was unaware that he couldn't see it. It was just not there. So they had disrupted this entire recognition system in the, in the visual cortex. And it was really interesting because the timing was incredibly important. It only worked if they were inducing the inhibition 70 to 130 milliseconds after the stimulus presentation. Um, we'll get into why this timing is really important when we get into things like attention. It actually takes about 60 to 100 milliseconds for the information to get from your eyes to the visual cortex. And so that's why this timing is really important because if you do it after, the signal has already left the visual cortex for further processing. And so this is disrupting that really early sensory processing. And we'll kind of talk about that more once we get into vision in the next couple of lectures. <clears throat> 
So really cool way to turn things on and off, kind of freaky. Uh, this other one is trans transcranial direct current stimulation. And so this one is delivering a constant flow of electricity through the brain between a cathode and an anode. So it's like a battery, the way the batteries are set up. Um, and it's delivering a direct current through there. And what happens is the neurons that are underneath this anode here are being depolarized. And so if they're being depolarized, that means that they're more likely to fire, right? We're making those cells more positive. So it'd be a lot easier for them to fire an action potential if they got any information. The neurons under the other side, under the cathode, are being hyperpolarized. So neurons in that region are being kind of inhibited. It's really hard for neurons in that area to fire. So this is something that I probably wouldn't want as a subject, is that these changes can last up to an hour after you've actually run all the current through them. And so it's something that's it's sustained. So when you're doing these types of things, you're probably not studying transient activity. You're studying activity that needs to be sustained for long periods of time. And it's got really poor spatial resolution. So it's really hard to target exactly what you want to target. Um, this is something that was used kind of early on. Um, I don't think it's used nearly as frequently. Uh, the more widely used version of this is instead of using direct current, uh, they use alternating current. And so what we were just talking about was if the cathode and the anode have different properties, right? You're hyperpolarizing, you're depolarizing. If you're switching the current, then you're switching which is hyperpolarized and which is depolarized over and over again. And what you're able to do is you're able to create these oscillations, right? So you're able to get the neurons to start firing in sync with one another. Um, a lot of use with this type of stuff, uh, they've noticed like with meditation, that meditation produces theta waves in the brain. And so there's a lot of researchers that are trying to artificially produce theta to see if you can get the same types of benefit that you get from meditation with this artificial type of stimulation. There's actually a lot of companies that are just like selling these devices and you can do it to yourself. Um, Mike Posner here at U of O is actually doing studies that are showing that theta waves um, can actually increase the white matter in your brain and increase the connectivity. So this is kind of a cool direction. It's not super widely used, but a uh, really interesting technology. So those are kind of at the forefront right now. They're not really, really used by a lot of cognitive neuroscientists, but there's some clever ones that are trying to figure out different ways that they can uh, institute them. And we'll see a couple of TMS studies throughout the course as we get into some of the higher cognitive stuff. Um, this next category is a category that's really prevalent, especially early on before MRI really took hold and started to get as big as it was. Um, we wanted to be able to measure the actual firing of the electrons, the actual electrical activity that was going on. And the most prominent of these types of recording activities is EEG, so electroencephalography, the mouthful. So EEG is using surface electrodes, which are these that are all over his head here, to try to pick up um, the polar activity of the neurons that are underneath the skull. And there's a lot of different types of like net configurations that you'll see. Uh, some researchers have nets that only use 20 electrodes. Some use as many as like 250. Uh, using more electrodes is a way of trying to get better spatial precision. They're trying to localize where the signal's coming from. And as we'll see with, uh, with EEG, the strength of the signal is decreasing with distance. So most of the stuff that we're picking up on with EEG is very superficial. It's cortical stuff. Um, but the problem with EEG is that these electrical signals that it's picking up on are actually bouncing all over the skull. Because you have this, this really hard skull that you have to measure on the outside of. And those signals may be produced here, and they may bounce off the skull and end up at electrodes over here really hard to localize where that signal came from. 
The really nice thing with EEG, though, is we know exactly when it happened. It has really, really good temporal precision, but it has really bad spatial precision. So we know when things are happening, but we have a lot harder of a time trying to figure out exactly where. There are some kind of advanced algorithms that are coming on board with EEG these days that are making that localization procedure a lot more refined. Um, and they're able to narrow it down a lot more using more electrodes and things like that. There are some researchers that are doing simultaneous EEG and MRI to try to localize signals. Um, but as you'll see as we go through these methods, this is something that's really, really important that I want you guys to know are the different spatial and temporal properties between all these methods. Because that's what we struggle with as cognitive researchers is the interplay between these two. Because as you'll see, most of the methods that we use either have really good temporal precision or they have really good spatial precision, but there's nothing that's really like perfect right in the middle. So the way that EEG works is it's picking up on the electrical activity that's happening from both EPSPs and IPSPs. And so what's happening here is you have the dendrites of the cell are up here at the top. And as the dendrites receive information from neurotransmitters and from things like that, this area is either getting more negative or it's getting more positive. And that's polarizing the cell because this side of the cell is kind of staying the same. And this difference in electrical activity between the dendrites and the actual cell is producing that electrical signal that we're able to pick up on. And we're able to pick up on those changes in that activity. And this is what we were talking about as far as like being polar. The, the phrases depolarization and hyperpolarization are referring to how polarized the dendrites versus the soma of the cell are. So like I said at the beginning of this lecture, there's a lot of stuff in here that's, that's pretty complicated that I don't need you guys to, to really wrap your heads around. But it's nice to just kind of have the seed planted to know what it is that we're actually picking up on. And like I mentioned at the beginning, we're really not able to distinguish between excitation and inhibition to a like refined degree. So this is kind of what I was just getting at. Um, the, the pyramidal cells, this is a very specific layer in the cortex, are the ones that are the most excitable. Those are the ones that we're picking up the most information from. So when you're studying the signals that come from EEG, what you want to look for are event-related potentials. So let's say that a really simple experimental paradigm, let's say that we're showing someone a red bar or we're showing someone a black bar, right? And we show them a bunch of black bars and we show them a bunch of red bars. This signal up here is the raw signal that we're getting. Okay? This is what it looks like. It's really noisy. We'll talk about what noise is here in just a minute. But if we average all of the signals from when the black bar was presented, so this would be like when the black bar was presented. Let's say that we presented 150 black bars throughout the experiment. If we average the signals of all of those black bars, what ends up happening is that we eliminate a lot of this noise and we get a much clearer signal. This down here, this averaged signal, is the event-related potential. So something that you guys should wrap your heads around is the fact that EEG, our ability to pick up on this signal, has actually been around for like 150 years. Our ability to actually analyze it has been within the last 20 years. Because there is a lot of data to look at. Because I mean, this is looking at things on a millisecond type basis. And experiments can be an hour, an hour and a half long. So if you're thinking about how many different time points you have, it's pretty astronomical. So you really need some really heavy computing power to be able to do this kind of stuff. Um, so what they do is they actually they look for these very specific waves that happen after the stimulus onset. And you'll see as we get into to later stuff about attention and about other things that these waves have been named certain things. And they're very specific to either sensory information or to attention information and those kind of things. 
But keep in mind too that this is also thousands of neurons. This isn't just picking up on one neuron. We're kind of summing up. So this is, this is really important, and this kind of gets back, this isn't something I'm going to test you on, but just to kind of conceptualize a lot of this. Um, so negative deflections in this, this wave are due to either excitatory things that are happening on the surface or inhibitory things that are happening really deep that are interfering with the signal. And there's no way of picking up which it is of the two. And positive deflections are either inhibitory stuff that's happening on the surface or excitatory stuff that's happening down below. So there's a lot of complexity and nuance to what we're actually picking up. Um, and it really limits what you're able to infer about the population as a whole. So what I really want you guys to know about event-related potentials is that it's an average signal across multiple stimulus presentations. And that it's also looking at thousands of neurons. It's not just looking at one. So this is something with all data collection procedures, there's always some type of noise that you have to deal with. Um, EEG is very susceptible to a lot of different types of noise. Uh, and noise just refers to anything that's not the signal that you're trying to pick up on, right? So outside versions of noise, Electrical activity in the room, just from the computers that are plugged in, wires that are running through the walls, all of that kind of stuff puts off an electrical signal that those electrodes are picking up. And it's hard to tell whether or not you're looking at brain activity or if you're looking at a bunch of electrical activity from the room. Um, there are a lot of people that uh, will reduce this by using equipment that only uses direct current. And there are a lot of other people that will actually stick their participants in a Faraday cage. So a Faraday cage is a, a room that's been kind of sealed off from any type of um, electrical interference. And so they use like certain metals to line the entire room that kind of absorb that electrical activity and it never gets to the electrodes. That's expensive and it's, it's hard to do. So a lot of EEG researchers, researchers have to just deal with the noise that's coming from their electrical equipment. The more tricky stuff is physiological noise. So this has to do with your heart beating, right? As your heart beats, there's electrical activity that's associated with that. There's electrical activity in the muscle movement, all that kind of stuff. So that's producing a certain type of noise. It's regular, which is nice, because it's if you can see when the heartbeats are happening, you can actually filter the data out and you can get rid of that noise. Um, a lot of people, when they're doing EEG, will actually take uh, cardio, like vascular type recordings as well to see when that stuff is lining up with their EEG signal so they can take it out. Um, the, the ones that really kill EEG are movements. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have ever been in an EEG study, but if you just tense up your face, the entire screen goes wild, right? Um, there are a lot of uh, researchers that will actually put electrodes on the face to record electrical activity. They know that that's what that's picking up. And so that helps to filter that out. But just know that there's a lot of noise going on. The idea with ERP that we just talked about is that if you average over a ton of different trials, a lot of that noise will fall out because the noise isn't consistent across all of your trials. So the signal should stand out if you average across a bunch of different stuff. So that's kind of what the, the last point was. So. EEG has made a big impact on kind of this idea of brain waves, on synchronous activity that happens in the brain. And these different types of synchronization actually refer to different um, states of being, whether or not you're asleep or you're meditating or you're really alert. Uh, you have different frequencies that appear in these bands. And like, it's trippy. When you're, I, when I did EEG research, uh, you could tell when the subject was falling asleep. All of a sudden, you'd see these alpha waves showing up. You'd like knock on the window, like, hey, <laughs> wake up. So this isn't necessarily something I'm going to test you on. I don't need you to know that alpha is drowsiness or anything like that. Um, it's just this idea that these different synchronous rhythms, and when you really think about it, it's really cool. You have these neurons that are, that are firing together, 
these really um, noticeable patterns depending on whether or not you're attending to things or whether or not you're falling asleep. So something to keep in mind as we think about the different research that comes out later in the class. So ECOG is really kind of cool because right? it, it fixes some of the, the spatial problems with EEG. Uh, this is done on patients, like I was mentioning earlier, that have really bad seizures and they're trying to figure out where those seizures are coming from. And so the patients actually have their, their heads opened up and they lay a mesh thing of electrodes directly on the brain. And they'll have these in for, for days or weeks while the, the doctors are trying to figure out things. Um, these patients are usually bombarded by requests from psychologists to study them while they have these things on their brain. Um, so you got to keep in mind this is a very limited uh, sample of people, right? The sample that you're studying is a sample of people that are epileptic. So what you're finding may not translate to other populations and things like that. But it has much better spatial precision than EEG. It's not perfect. Um, it's definitely not perfect, but you get a lot better localization with this. Limitations, though, are we can't just cut all our participants open and put things on the brain. <laughs> really? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> IRB. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's ECOG. So same thing as EEG, it's just directly on the brain, and that's preventing the skull from interfering, right? talking earlier about how those electrical signals will actually bounce all over the head. And so it's hard to pick up where they were coming from. And so this takes out a lot of that guesswork. MEG is this really fancy uh, upside down toilet on their head. Uh, kind of cool. Uh, it fixes some of the, the problems with EEG. It gives a lot better spatial precision. And what it's doing is it's picking up on the magnetic fields. Um, and so whenever something produces electricity, it produces a magnetic field that is in a circle perpendicular to the flow of the electricity. And the MEG uses this series of, they call them squids, these series of receptors that are kind of like an EEG net over the brain to pick up those different magnetic fields. The problem is that because the magnetic fields are produced perpendicular to the flow of electricity, the MEG is only able to pick up activity from neurons that are inside these sulci because they're oriented horizontally. If the neurons are, 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 are vertical, so like ones like here in the top of the gyri, their field is produced in an opposite manner and the MEG can't pick it up. So just like EEG, this has really good temporal precision. It's really good at telling us when things are happening. It has much better spatial resolution than EEG, but um, it has some inherent limitations. So it can only pick up stuff that's happening in the soul side. Um, it can't really differentiate stuff that's coming from deeper down the brain. So it's, it's a really cool step in the right direction because we're, we're starting to kind of tackle that spatial and temporal problem, right? We're getting better spatial precision. We're able to know like where in the soul side this is coming from, but it's it's definitely not perfect. Um, and the other huge limitation of this is that this machine is extremely expensive. You have to build an entire Faraday cage around it, like we mentioned, that blocks out all of the magnetic influences. So it's blocking out the magnetic field of the earth that the machine will pick up on, any types of magnetic fields from electrical equipment. Um, so this is very susceptible to that type of noise. And we'll talk about, um, this isn't a really widely used technique because of these limitations of how expensive it is and things, um, and how you can kind of get better stuff with MRI, but there are some studies that we'll talk about throughout the course that use MEG. And the other step, something that solves both temporal and spatial problems is single cell recording. This is another one of those things like with ECOG where it's not necessarily something that we can just do to humans. We can't just implant electrodes inside their head. Uh, but this was a huge, huge advancement in the neuroscience field as, as a whole. 
the ability to record directly from an individual neuron while the, the mouse or whatever the monkey is, is living and doing things is really, really cool. And the way that it works is that electrodes are actually implanted down into the space around the cell. They're not put into the cell, because they're put into the cell, it usually kills the cell. Um, but as we talked about in the last lecture, when a cell fires, it opens up pores in the other cells that let ions in, right? And if ions are flowing into the cell, then the space outside of the cell is changing. The electrical properties are changing. And that's what these are picking up on. And so they're kind of making the assumption that if, like, if the stuff outside of the cell is changing, that means that stuff is flowing into the cell, the cell is firing. And so this is a very important thing that we will come back to a lot, especially in these next couple of lectures when we're talking about sensory stuff. Because what this allowed was for researchers for the first time to map out what exactly neurons in different parts of the brain were responding to. Right? You could show them a line or an object or something, um, and after showing them tons of different stuff while recording from this one cell, they could finally figure out, like, oh, this cell is firing for a line at this orientation, or this cell is firing for a picture of a hand. Right? This made huge advancements in the way that we understand sensory input. When it gets to higher cognitive stuff, it's a little bit trickier. Monkeys can't really tell us what they're feeling or what they're thinking about, things like that. So a lot of the work done with a uh, single cell and multi-unit, multi-unit just refers to the fact that they advanced the technology and could record from a bunch of different neurons at the same time, that really advanced our ability to understand these early sensory processing systems that are really conserved through different animals. A really cool use of this is brain-computer interfaces. So this is done with humans, just like with ECOG. So there are certain patients that um, are paralyzed due to MS or some other kind of uh, disorder. And there are a lot of research teams that are working really, really hard to try to restore function for these people. And so what they'll do is they'll actually put these multi-unit recording devices into their motor cortex. It takes a lot of training. And so what will happen is they'll have these electrodes in the motor cortex, and the researcher will tell the patient, I want you to imagine opening your hand, right? And he'll sit there and he'll imagine opening his hand and they'll record activity and they'll teach the computer that signal means open the hand. Over and over again until finally just the thought is producing motion in these really cool robotic arms. I would highly encourage looking up the DARPA arm on YouTube. It's freaking cool. Uh, it takes, just keep in mind, it takes a lot of training to get to where they are. But one of the coolest things I think I've ever seen in neuroscience is the fact that after this person has trained himself, has seen that his thoughts are producing movement in this external robotic arm, the neurons actually wire themselves to give the device a better signal. Like that's just amazing that these neurons are like at the single cell level are like sentient enough to figure out that like they're having an impact on what's going on in the organism. There are a ton of research teams that are doing some really heavy work on brain-computer brain interfacing. Elon Musk is one of them. He's got a company called Neuralink. He's creating what he calls the wizard hat. Um, he just released his first white paper a couple of weeks ago. They're, devi they're developing nanofibers that are going to be implanted in the brain with robotic techniques that are supposed to be able to record activity and also deliver signals. Um, I mean, he's got this whole thing about artificial intelligence and how it's going to pass us up if we don't find a way to interface with it. Um, he's claiming that he's doing it so that he can restore function to paralyzed patients, but if you actually listen to him talk about it, he just wants to have a wizard hat. Uh, <laughs> so really, really exciting stuff is going on on this, this front. Uh, this isn't really heavily used in neuroscience in general just because of its limitations. You can't pop it into a patient really easily. So this next portion is going to be what we come back to the most throughout the class. Um, it's the type of imaging that is not looking at electrical activity. It's looking at metabolic activity. So it's looking at restoring nutrients to the neurons that are firing. So the neurons have all this activity, and they need to be replenished. That's what metabolic means. They're using up resources and need more. So 
This was pioneered in the 1990s, uh, these imaging techniques. This guy right here was the badass I talked about on the first day of class. He's like right upstairs, Mike Posner. Uh, so he was actually really prominent just in the cognitive psychology field. He did a bunch of reaction time work, created the queuing task, which we'll get back to when we get to attention. But he got together with uh, Marcus Rochelle and their graduate student, Stephen Peterson, and they were the first ones to start to actually work with, uh, with functional type imaging of trying to use PET and MRI to, to look at how the brain was acting. And this is just getting back to what I just said on that last slide, is that functional neuroimaging is not measuring electrical activity, it's measuring metabolic activity. And we'll kind of look at the limitations of this in a minute. Uh, you also want to keep in mind that this research is correlational. So it's hard to really tell what is causing these things to happen. Uh, in order to test causation, you need to be able to perturb the system. Like with TMS, you need to be able to turn it off and on. Uh, with this stuff, we're just kind of making them do things, and we're watching it, and we're saying, okay, this behavior is correlated with this type of brain activity. So there's some inherent limitations to that. So they devised this really cool way of looking at brain activity with these terms using what are called contrasts. So everything in neuroimaging is one thing relative to another thing. So what you have, let's say that you had someone in there pushing a button, right? If you want to know what brain activity is correlated with button pushing, then you have them push a button and then you have them do nothing. And what you do is you compare the brain activity when they're doing nothing to the brain activity when they're pushing the button. And it's actually a pure subtractive method. So you're taking the button pushing activity and you're just subtracting out the activity from when they're doing nothing. And whatever's left is what was more active during button pushing than when they were doing nothing. So the question is always, where is activity for task A greater than task B? And so when you look at these different types of figures that are in fMRI research, you're always going to see these, this is the contrast. This is saying, show me where objects are greater than positions. So when they're just thinking about what an object is versus when they're thinking about where the object is. And then the other side, so that's saying take all of the activity when they're looking at objects and subtract all the activity from when they're looking at positions. And if you want to look at the flip side, you take all of the activity from when they're looking at positions and you subtract out all the activity from when they're looking at objects. That's everything that's done in MRI is done that way. One of the issues is that the brain is always active. There's always stuff going on all over the place, right? So it's really hard to establish a baseline. Like, what is the brain doing when we're doing nothing? It's doing a lot of stuff, right? And so baseline is usually the times in between trials. You usually have like a fixation cross on the screen, and they'll just average all of the times when you're doing nothing with all the times that you're doing something. There's a lot of inherent problems to that, because if you've ever been in an experiment, you're not really ever doing nothing, or like thinking about what you had to eat last night, or like what you have to do after school. Like there's a lot of stuff that's kind of averaged into baseline that's not necessarily nothing, right? And it complicates how we do things. But the idea that a contrast is a subtractive method is a really, really important topic. Like this is how all PET and MRI works. So PET was the one that was used first. Uh, Posner and Rochelle uh, did this contrast with PET imaging at first. And the way that PET imaging works is they inject the radioactive tracer into the bloodstream that's able to pass the blood-brain barrier. And the idea is if neurons are active and they're using up resources, then blood is going to flow into those areas and it's going to deposit a bunch of this radioactive tracer. And so you're then able to use these sensors and you're able to pick up the radioactivity from that tracer in the form of gamma rays. And so you're able to say, okay, if a bunch of tracer was deposited in this part of the brain, then that means that that part of the brain was being used during that task. Um, it's also, like I said, it's a contrast method. And so they had a bunch of tracer that was deposited during a baseline condition and a bunch of tracer that was deposited during the actual task and subtract out the two. So the, this is, I just kind of split up the slides. There's a lot of uh, text on that one slide and one that I gave you. Um, but this kind of gets into the resolution. So uh, it's got 
pretty decent spatial resolution, five to 10 millimeters, which is way better than the electrical recording stuff that we were looking at. Um, the temporal precision is terrible. Uh, it's 20 seconds to the order of minutes. And that temporal precision is directly late, related to how much tracer has to be deposited before they can pick up on the signal. So they have to get them to just continue doing something over and over and over and over again until a bunch of tracer gets deposited, and then they're able to pick up on it. So we have no idea really when it happens, but we know that it happened in that spot within a five to 10 millimeter radius. So this is usually used because of how long it takes. It's usually used to study types of brain activity that are sustained. Magnetic resonance imaging, on the other hand, uses a giant magnet. Uh, it ranges from 1.5 to 11 Teslas in magnetic strength. And to put that into perspective, this is the actual scanner that we use here at, uni at the university. Uh, it is a three Tesla, and that is 60,000 times as strong as the, mag as the Earth's magnetic field. Really, really strong magnets. There are some up in, I think, Wisconsin that are up to 11 Tesla that are doing amazing types of resolution. Uh, I would love to have an 11 Tesla machine. But um, so these can be used to study both structural and functional stuff. So they were actually be, they were used first to study structural stuff. They were used in clinics to, to look at whether or not there was stroke and things like that. Because the spatial resolution is amazing, as we'll look at in a second. Um, and then it was Posner and Rachel and all them that started to notice that we can also use this to look at functional stuff. Um, and functional just refers to the idea that we're picking up on actual activity. And the resolution, I can go back. Yeah. You're all good. You're all good. <laughs> we got like 10, 15 minutes left, so. Okay. Cool. Um, so this one has really, really good spatial resolution um, up to, and this 0.5 is actually uh, higher than what you can actually get to. You can get down to 0 0.2, 0 0.3 with 11 Tesla machines, so you can get really, really fine spatial precision. So you can see, like, this is exactly where the activity was happening. Uh, you have much better temporal resolution than PET. So PET was like 20 seconds to a minute. This is picking up things about 4 to 15 seconds. Um, and this is because we're waiting on blood flow to come into that area. And we'll talk about the bold signal here in a second. So, most important thing about MRI is that it's got really, really good spatial precision. Uh, temporal, pre temporal precision's not the greatest, but we're really, really accurate at pinpointing where the stuff is coming from. Um, this one, for time's sake, I think I'm going to skip this one, so I'm not going to test you guys on this stuff. Uh, this is just this idea that because of the inherent limitations in the temporal precision, uh, there are very specific types of experimental design that can be done with PET versus MRI. So PET, you have to do these block designs, which are sustained activity, where you're showing them the same stimulus over and over and over again, and the same stimulus over and over and over again. Whereas with MRI, because it's got a better temporal resolution, you can actually like do a random um, assortment of stimuli and that would be event related. Um, don't worry about memorizing this. I know I have this stuff highlighted, but uh, I won't test you guys on this. Uh, so the way that MRI works is really cool. It takes advantage of quantum properties. And so you have these hydrogen protons in your brain all over your body. And when we're just walking around in this really low magnetic field that the Earth puts off, these hydrogen atoms are kind of, or hydrogen protons are oriented in just random assortments all over the place. There's no net magnetic field that you can pick up on because they're kind of canceling each other out. That's kind of what this is showing, is that because they're all in different directions, there's no kind of net magnetic field. But when you put them in a really strong magnet, they all align to the magnetic field. And because they all align to the magnetic field, we're able to pick up on this magnetic property because they're all kind of pointing in the same direction. 
And then what's really, really cool is that we do a radio frequency pulse that's in the opposite direction as the magnetic field, and it knocks all these protons over. And these protons, they're also spinning, and they're kind of spinning out of sync. And this radio frequency pulse knocks them over and lines up all of their spins. And then what happens is once you remove this radio frequency pulse, these protons will start to align themselves back to the magnetic field. And different tissues have different properties, and these protons will actually line back up at different time lengths in different types of tissues. So in white matter versus gray matter versus fluid, dark bone, and things like that. And so it's actually, we're not taking pictures of the brain. We're kind of projecting a picture of the brain based on how these things line back up. It's really cool. I'm not going to test you on this, but this is just kind of nice for those of you that want to go into the field to understand what it is that the MRI is actually doing. And it's, this is important. It's acquiring these signals in these little chunks all at a time that are called voxels. They're just volumetric pixels. So it's like a pixel that you have on a computer, but it's 3D. And the magnet, the sensors are picking up a signal in individual voxels. And so they're measuring the protons relaxation in all of these different points. The stronger your magnet is, the smaller the voxels are. So think about when you're taking a picture. If you have a low megapixel camera, your pixels are really large, right? And you don't have really good resolution. It's a really blurry image. But as your camera gets better, if you have high megapixels, the, the pixels themselves are tiny. And because there's so many of them, you're able to zoom in. You have really good resolution. It's the exact same thing that's going on with MRI. The stronger the magnet is, the smaller the voxels are, and the, like, the better the resolution is. You can zoom in. You can see structures a lot better. It's not as blurry. Structural scans are ones that take advantage of the time it takes for the proton to come back up. These are the ones that are really high resolution. So this is called a T1 weighted scan. So if you ever go in to do a, an MRI experiment, um, you'll notice that they'll probably have you do some kind of a task that they're not recording brain activity during because they're taking a really high depth picture. This usually takes about uh, eight to 15 minutes to put this thing together. And these can be used on their own. There's a lot of cognitive research people that just use the structural images to look at how thick the cortex is between people and whether or not that matters for different things. Uh, but these are also used to line things up as we'll see later. Um, you can take low resolution functional stuff and you can map it on to the high resolution structural stuff. This is my brain. <laughs> what kind of a slice is this? Sagittal. Yep. So this is a sagittal, this is a coronal, and this is an axial. And you'll see all MRI software breaks it down into those three views. And so you can kind of view everything in 3D from the three different planes. The T2 or T2 star is our functional image. And so this is actually not looking at how long it takes the protons to get back up. It's looking at how long it takes the protons to stop spinning together. Um, that's not something you guys need to necessarily know. Um, but functional images are taken every two to four seconds. So uh, the types of studies that I do, our scanner takes 176 images every two seconds, right? So lots and lots of images really, really quickly because of the fact that it's like that, because the last one I just showed you, I said it took eight to 15 minutes to produce that really high resolution picture. So functional images are a lot lower in resolution, right? The voxels are bigger. But if we have a structural scan of someone's brain and we have a functional scan of someone's brain, we can map the functional stuff onto the structural stuff. So we can actually take the low resolution stuff and project it into the high resolution space. 
And this is where we're actually picking up the bold signal. There's differences between T2 and T2 star. T2 star is what's used to pick up the bold signal. T2 is usually used in like clinical settings. Um, you don't necessarily have to know the, the difference between those. It has to do with inhomogeneities in the field, some complicated physics stuff. And so what we're picking up on, this is a very important slide, is the blood oxygenation level dependence. And so our blood has a ratio of how much oxygenated blood there is and how much deoxygenated the blood, the blood is. And deoxygenated hemoglobin is paramagnetic. You can pick it up with a magnet. And so let's take this for example, right? You have this ratio of oxygenated, deoxygenated blood. The brain is active. And so because those neurons are active, they're using up oxygen, right? And if they're using up oxygen, that means there's going to be more deoxygenated blood, right? So the deoxygenated portion is going to go up. Then they send a signal to the astrocytes, and they say, we need more oxygen. And a bunch of oxygenated blood flows in, and way more than the neurons actually need. So we actually see a huge spike. So it goes from being really deoxygenated, because there's a bunch of consumption, to being extremely oxygenated. And that's what we're picking up on. We can actually see that entire curve of it was, there was a bunch of oxygen used, so it got really deoxygenated, and then it got reoxygenated, and it comes back down. And because we know what that curve looks like, we're able to look for it with our statistical techniques. And this is called the hemodynamic response. So you have the neurons fire, that's what this red line is, and because they fired, you have this rise in deoxygenated blood, and then as the blood gets reoxygenated, you have the bold signal dropping. So this is actually picking up the point at which there was the most deoxygenated hemoglobin, is what that peak is. That's like it used up all of its resources. And you'll notice that that peak is about five to six seconds after the actual neural activity. And then it kind of drops off. That's what lasts. If you see things about the bold signal being like four to 15 seconds, it's talking about this entire curve, this entire chemodynamic response. And this right here is something that I've hinted at a couple of times now. This is a very, very important term right here, is the fact that the only reason that we're able to pick up on anything is because it's local. Neurons fire. They ask for resources, and those resources are only delivered to where the firing was happening. Somewhat. There are some limitations, but that's kind of the idea. If it was a diffuse property, if blood was just going everywhere, we wouldn't be able to pick up on anything. So the fact that it's local is really, really important. This next slide is not important for you guys to, to know as far as test stuff goes. This is showing the limitations in the bold signal. Right? So there were some studies that were done where they did MRI at the same time that they were doing single cell recording in animals. And so these single cell recordings, this green line right here is the actual activity of the cells. The black line is the local field potential. And the way that you can think about it is green line is firing, black line is listening. Because listening is actually more costly than firing is. Because most of the energy that the cells are using up are trying to maintain their homeostasis. And so when ion channels are opening in the dendrites, they're like closing things up. And so this is a mixture of both EPSPs and IPSPs. And so you can see that the bold signal actually follows the local field potential really well. But it doesn't track actual firing really, really well. So it's something to kind of keep in, keep in the back of your mind that like, the bold signal is definitely picking up on activity per se, but it's kind of a mixture of firing and listening. And that's kind of what that was talking about. Um, there's also studies that have reported negative bold. Listening, so, so let's say a neuron fires an action potential, and that action potential goes down the axon, right? And it releases neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters will get picked up by a different cell. Those neurotransmitters don't necessarily mean that that other cell is going to fire. 
right? You have to have enough neurotransmitter to get that other one to fire. That's the listening. Okay. Is like enough neurotransmitter, enough firing has to cause that other one to go. And that whole process is very costly. Mm -hmm. So bold is actually picking up on both the firing activity and just the transient like listening from the dendrites. Like I mentioned the other day, dendrites can connect to about 10,000 different neurons, right? And so just because one neuron fires doesn't mean the other one's gonna fire. It's kind of a summation of all of the 10,000. And that's kind of where the listening comes in. So this kind of puts things into perspective about how computationally demanding fMRI is. So in the studies that I do, the resolution that we have, I have brains that are about 250 voxels, right? And I'm getting a bold signal in every single one of those, two, let's say 200,000. I'm getting a bold signal in every single one of those 200,000 voxels. A new image is taken every two seconds when I'm doing functional stuff. So that means I have 200,000 more data points every two seconds. There's usually, uh, I have the experiment I just ran, did six runs that were about 200 time points a piece. So that was like 1,200 time points of 200,000 different data points. They also have tons of subjects. The experiment we just ran had 114 subjects. This one is kind of a, a typical study with 30 people. You take all of this stuff into account, 6 billion data points that you have to take into account. So the computational stuff with this is insane. One person's functional image takes up like hundreds of gigabytes of data. So I just ran models on, I think, six people, and it was like four terabytes of output. So lots and lots. You have to have supercomputers to do this. Like it's, it's pretty crazy how much computational power is required for this stuff. Um, this is something that uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the dead, the dead fish study. Um, so this was something that uh, a lot of people that don't understand MRI gave MRI a lot of flack because these researchers put a dead salmon in the, in the magnet and they did all of the computational stuff that we do and they actually found activity in its brain. So the problem that we're running into here is that when we do statistics with MRI, we're actually doing a separate statistical test at every single voxel in the brain. And if you guys remember anything from statistics, the more t-tests you do, the higher your type one error rate is. So there's a, there's a huge chance that you're gonna pick up false positives. Um, because of this, so that was this 5% type one error for every test you do, and that kind of compounds. So that means one out of every 20 tests that you do is, has the potential to be false, right? And so, what we do, this is kind of advanced, um, but we actually look for clusters of neurons, or clusters of voxels that are acting the same way. Um, and we treat that entire cluster as one statistical test instead of all of the individual voxels. And that allows us to reduce the space. So instead of doing 200,000 statistical tests, we're doing like four statistical tests. You get a lot of activity that drops out with this kind of stuff. Uh, it makes things very complicated. And what I'm kind of trying to demonstrate here is that even though MRI is showing us a lot of really cool stuff, there's tons of limitations to what we're actually able to say about this data. And the other issue that's, that I struggle with every day, because I look at different people's brains all the time. So uh, this one right here is my brain. This is somebody else's brain. And you'll notice Look here, you see how these gyri and these sulci look completely different than mine do? When you're comparing multiple people, you have to line up their brains and you have to put their brains into the same shape so you can line up the different regions. <coughs> so everybody has a unique shaped brain, you have to line everything up. And so we're trying to say that like, if this part of my, if, if this part of my brain is active, is it the same in your brain? And the only way to do that is to put everybody's brain in the same space. So there's this standard space called MNI space. It was an average of 152 brains. And what we do is we warp everybody's brain to fit this template. So the shape is warped completely. And it's, it's non-linear. Like we'll stretch out some sulci and some gyri, and we make everybody's brain look the same shape so that we can line things up. The problem is that, as you can probably tell, this is not a perfect system at all. 
So imagine being a personality researcher and you have this like the CSV that has like all of your different conditions that you're studying, every all your different questions. And you're worried about whether or not this subject's columns are lined up with this subject's columns. And you're running all these correlations. Like there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. So MRI, there's a huge chance that we're not lining up the same things across people and that we're missing things. Uh, there's a lot of really cool stuff that's going on where we're trying to do what's called functional reg registration, where we're lining things up based on what regions were active instead of the shape. Um, but this is just taking advantage of landmarks, lining up the ventricles, lining up the, the gyri and the sulci. So that was kind of, that was a lot. Uh, MRI, these last two slides are just showing some extensions to what you can do with MRI uh, to look at connectivity, connectivity measures. So resting state is one that's, that's huge, that's really picking up a lot of steam these days. And what you do is you put someone in the scanner and you have them do nothing. They just sit there. Um, some people have them look at a blank screen. Some of them have them just look at a cross. Uh, and they record activity over their brain over an extended period of time. And then they look back at that activity and they try to see what regions are going up and down together. right? So just, just normal fluctuations. Because when we're not doing anything, our neurons are still kind of firing in synchronous rhythms like we saw with EEG. And so they're seeing which regions are synchronized with each other. And they've come across these like these networks that are functionally connected.
Yeah. How accurate is that going to be if your mind's going to be wandering and doing nothing? It's crazy because that was that was a lot of the the kind of uh, stuff that came out at the beginning of like how is this going to work because everybody's doing something different. But this has been done dozens of times and the same networks pop out over and over and over again. So it's really, really robust. It's been replicated a ton. We're actually showing that this next slide, which is, so this is functional connectivity. So this isn't looking at actual connections. This is just saying we saw that these things are firing together, okay? The other side of that is diffusion imaging, which is looking at the way that water diffuses along tracks in the brain. And so we can see if water is diffusing in a certain direction, it's usually diffusing along the axon, and we can trace all of the white matter tracks. That's what this image in the background is. The different colors refer to the different directions of those tracks. So blue tracks are going up and down, and green tracks are going left and right through the corpus callosum, and then the red tracks, which are hard to see in this one, are ones that are going front to back. And so we can map out the direction that water's moving in the brain, and we can trace all of these white matter tracks. And this gives us an account of structural connectivity. So this is actually showing what's connected in the brain versus what looks like it's connected based on how they're firing. And we're seeing that these white matter tracks are connecting the same regions that we're seeing or communicating together from resting state. So this is like further evidence that even though people are mind wandering, mind wandering or whatever, we're still picking up on something that's really robust. Um, and hopefully a lot of this will make more sense as we start getting into different studies.